Hello from Singapore. I'm on the road. I'll be moving on from here next to Hong Kong and then to Japan. But today for you, I've got the second part of an interview I recently shot with Stefano Suigo. He's a hugely inspiring language learner. Stefano trained as a translator, focusing in on English and German, but then he learned Portuguese, French, Japanese, and most recently Georgian. So without further ado, let's continue the conversation. I don't know about the word easily, but uh, yeah. <laughs> and so that's, is that equivalent to what would that be on the common European framework of reference? I, th I think it, it should be, should be uh, between B1 and B2 yeah. uh, in, yeah. in the CEFR. So a very yeah. solid intermediate level Japanese yes, then. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. And what about what came next then? Which other languages have you, you mentioned Romanian? Uh... That, that I think French came before because um, I moved to, when I moved, moved to Brussels, I actually didn't like French and I didn't want to learn French and I refused for some years to 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 learn it and uh, I was living there but just using it like ordering an ice cream and uh, and saying bad bad words instead of um, of ordering the right ice cream um so for I think two or three years I refused to to learn it and then all of a sudden pam uh, I think through music and um songs I started to like it and I decided, well, why not? And then, and French is the only language that I, that I um, learned without studying it. I just uh, listened a lot in the street and I tried to imitate the sounds. And uh, it, was, it was amazing for me because I had never thought that I would be able to learn a language that way. For me, uh, up, up until that point, language learning was, you know, sit down and look at the grammar and how it works and then build like a house, uh, uh, a, a building like that. But uh, with French, it was completely, it was, it was the opposite. You know, I never looked at a, at a book, at a textbook. And I just, uh, okay, obviously as a Romance language and very um, next to, to Italian, it was uh, much easier for me to pick pick it up, you say, right? Pick it up that way. Uh, I don't think I would be able to pick up Polish uh, in the <laughs> as I did with French. But yeah, that was quite uh, striking for for myself as well. And after French, uh, I think that was Romanian. I started learning Romanian because um, my wife had done the same i mean she she had learned romanian and i and i went to visit her in romania during a course and i was fascinated by by the country by the people everybody was so um friendly and uh, and there as well just like in in brussels all of a sudden the language started to sound really beautiful so when i when i came back to brussels i decided you know what i'm going to learn this too and maybe then talk to my wife in Romanian as well, so that we have one more language in common. <laughs> Is your wife Italian? No, she's a Finn. Oh, she's Finnish. Okay, so you would, yeah. you'd already got the Finnish, uh, a, a, a reason to use a lot of Finnish then in that case. Um, would you say yeah, you've met her after, after learning Finnish? I met uh, her yes, Finnish. yes, but it's way it, around. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yes. So, yeah, okay. Um, would you say you've got, you say you mentioned you picked up French just by being there listening to music and so on. And I take the point, obviously it's relatively close to Italian, but would you yeah. say that you had a good ear instinctively for languages uh, in terms of the sounds of languages, or is it a skill which has developed because you were already on your fourth, fifth language by the time you got to French? You were already a very experienced language learner. So what's the balance between talent, uh, an ear for languages or a good memory and language success? Is it more about your talent or is it about building the skills or something else? That's a great question. I, I don't think I'm able to answer that uh, other than by saying that probably uh, your ear helps quite a lot, just like it, do, it does uh, in music. Uh, imagine learning to to play music, to, to play an instrument, and having no ear for for music. Wouldn't it be slightly more difficult, or a lot more difficult, maybe, than for someone who just, uh, without even thinking, 
plays plays on the piano a a, a melody i would say that it, it does so i think to, to that ex extent maybe although you yeah. said you thought you'd before you picked up french literally you hadn't thought of yourself. You've been somebody who had been quite conscious and got taken quite a studious approach to language learning. So you surprised yourself in a way with French. I did, absolutely. Absolutely, yes, I did. Uh, but, you, but you don't think that would uh, work the same way for Polish or you're learning Georgian at the moment. So uh, maybe it was, right, it was about the closeness of the language to Italian. Yes, exactly. I would say definitely because in in if I hear a, a French word that I have never heard before, but I can somewhat uh, recognize some Italian in it or some or some Portuguese or because there are many uh, similarities between Portuguese and, and French as well, or Spanish for that matter, uh, I can guess its meaning and I can much more easily. Uh, uh, remember, remember it, and use it myself the next time to to check if it's uh, if it's the right word for that context. Taking the story forward, you after Romanian, then I know you're learning Mandarin and Georgian at the moment. Are there any others I've missed out? Uh, Icelandic. Icelandic, of course. Yes. What's the story <laughs> there? What's the I story? say, of course, because I've okay. also done a bit of very, very basic Icelandic, so, and I remember that you yeah. were um, brushing yours up at the time of the Polyglot Conference in Iceland uh, exactly. two years exactly. ago. It was so. a great, the, the perfect time to brush it up. I had learned some Icelandic uh, 10 years before, so we're talking about a long time ago, um, just because I've, I've actually always loved Iceland, the country, uh, and its nature, and... Uh, yeah, when when I was young and I and I would look at the at a picture uh, from Iceland, I would say, "Wow, this is like uh, a fairy tale uh, place to visit." Uh, and I went there, and before going there, I learned some some Icelandic. Um, we're talking about uh, more than ten years ago, and then after that, I I think I had my first kid, and they went down the drain <laughs> but uh, um, when the polyglot conference was organized in Reykjavik I thought that would that would be the perfect time to um, to brush it up and I did and I went over the um, the level that I had achieved uh, back then and now I can actually hold conversations in, in Icelandic I, I was told I'm uh, around B1 which is Amazing because I don't th I don't think my vocabulary is at B one, but my you know, again the grammar, which is you probably remember how how complicated the grammar can be in Icelandic. Um, the the gr I, I have the feeling that sometimes my grammar knowledge keeps me afloat, <laughs> even though my vocabulary is not that uh, deeply developed, just because I don't really like learning vocabulary. And you've used your YouTube channel to sort of showcase or practice your Icelandic. So it's uh, lingua e passione. Uh, why did That's you start right. the channel, and uh, what does it? Is it important to you to have a channel uh, to use it uh, for your language learning? How does it fit in? Uh, the reason why I started the channel uh, was that I, I, all of a sudden, after the first. Um, uh, polyglot gathering that I attended in 2016, I suddenly felt the need to share this passion, and not not only my knowledge, but also just just the passion. I I know that I can do well. I, I can do the things I like. I can do them well, and uh, so this is a thing that I like, and I, and I hope I can do it well. So I was told by many other polyglots and friends, why don't you just go ahead and, and, and share it. Uh, I mean, there's nothing, nothing bad can happen if you share uh, what you know and what you like. So I started and I have to say that uh, it has given me a lot, uh, a lot of, um, it, it has been a very rewarding um, experience. And really, one of the most important parts of this reward is to see how people 
are happy uh, that I can help them and to see really the uh, it, it is also this also has to do with uh, starting my tutoring uh, career at the same time it, it it happened at the same time so it was really um, um, a mix a mixture of sharing and also uh, cha changing my th the way I've worked with languages up until that time because I didn't want to translate any more uh, as much as I did, but I wanted to have more contact with people. And I find that the um, gratefulness that I can see on uh, on the face of my students at the end of the lesson just gives me so much more than, than just translating a book, even though translating a book is a great experience as well. Do you, so you teach Italian, I presume, you, you teach Finnish as well. Uh, do mm -hmm. you offer Thank other you. languages? Uh, uh, yeah, I offer, I offer German and English um, conversation. Yes. And did you, when you were getting started, and now for that matter, do you use a teacher platform marketplace such as italki, or do you have your own website? How do people find you if they want to have lessons with you? I've been always on italki. Yeah. Some people say I'm italki, some people say italki, I don't know what the <laughs> right pronunciation is. Well, I, I asked one of their representatives once and he told me that anything goes, you could say either. So I don't know if that's still okay. the line. But um, uh, yeah, so and so, how would your week look now then? Between you know, How's your time split with these two careers between translation and language teaching? Is it half and a half? Or? Uh, when I have translation projects going on, it's like 90% translation and just a few spots here and there, a few uh, time slots open for for um, for tutoring. When I don't have translation, it's almost full time tutoring. And uh, but uh, being a father is actually my first job, I would say. Yeah. And um, between the two careers, then aside from fatherhood, which we we won't go there. Um, uh, because it's not a strong point of this channel, so I don't no, want to no. uh, <laughs> go over there having no children myself. But if people are watching or thinking, mm, I'd like, should I become, I'd love to become a translator or I'd love to start be being a language tutor, uh, would you say that both, would you recommend people to start out in either of those careers? Somebody who's watching who's just about to go off to college or thinking of a career change for that matter? Um, I would say that, that the being a translator really requires a lot of patience, uh, more than being a teacher. Actually, you would you would think you need a lot of patience for um, for being a teacher as well. But I but I believe uh, you need more patience as a um, as a translator, and you have to like being um, being by yourself and uh, organizing yourself a lot. So I, at, at this point in my life, I would say it, it's, the more, it's, it's the more difficult path between the two. Nowadays, thanks to the internet, you can become a teacher or a tutor pretty easily and, and quickly, thanks to uh, such platforms such as, such as italki. Uh, and they are so completely different these two jobs if you like talking to people and having having contact with people you should you should go for the tutoring of of course uh yeah that's my that's my take on it so many things i want to ask you and before we wind up i have to talk a bit about both uh, mandarin and georgian um now <laughs> the obvious question for mandarin i suppose would be has the fact that you'd already learned the kanji, the Chinese take on the, the Japanese take on the Chinese characters, did that really help you along with Mandarin? Yes, yes. Stupid yes. question, uh, okay. No, no, it's not, not at all, not at all. It's, uh, um, it's very, very interesting. Uh, you shouldn't, how, how can I say this? Um, <sighs> you shouldn't think that Knowing the kanji uh, makes it super easy to learn uh, the hanzi, uh, but they do help somewhat. 
and I find myself not understanding what my tutor in uh, my Chinese tutor please write it down in the you know in the Skype chat for example and when they write it I go oh I see of course because I can recognize um, some of all of the of the kanji and I go okay I, I know what it means but the, okay this helps me uh, understand what I see what I uh, read but they, they this did not help me at all to understand what I hear so it's yeah. Uh, and you have to associate the Chinese words, the sound of them, with the symbols which may be the same, which are the same in Japanese generally, but you've still got to link the two together. So that's still quite a lot of work. And yeah. uh, would you say Chinese is harder or easier than Japanese? Wow, I love this question. Uh, <laughs> I've thought about this so many times. And I would say at the beginning, uh, at the beginning, Chinese is easier. You can get to say full sentences, even with um, you know secondary clauses, etc., pretty soon in uh, in Chinese, as long as you got the pronunciation down. The pronunciation is the, the most difficult thing or challenging thing at the beginning in Chinese, but if you have that down, you know you can say quite a lot of things. Uh, and even complicated with even some somewhat complicated structures. In Japanese, it's the other way around. I think at the beginning, it's like, bam, <laughs> um, you you need much more time and effort to be able to express yourself, even at uh, w with very basic uh, things. Uh, but then probably. Um, it becomes easier when you're when you're going along. Whereas Chinese becomes much more complicated and uh, things are not as straightforward. I was told I'm not there, so I cannot really speak <laughs> about that stage. But uh, yeah, I hope this answers your question. And Georgian then, to finish, how did you get attracted to Georgian? That's one I've got uh, several books on the shelf behind me for Georgian, not used yet, although at one point I could decipher the wine bottles because I learned the alphabet, um, uh -huh. which was one of the things that attracted me. But what's your story with Georgian? Of course, the alphabet plays a big role as well here. Uh, it's just lovely, isn't it? <laughs> Beautiful, yes. Um, but I met... Uh, couple of Georgian people in uh, back in I think it was in Heidelberg. yeah it was in Heidelberg obviously in Germany and we got along very well and uh, uh, I was just curious and they they taught me the alphabet and the numbers that's it that's it that, that was my Georgian back uh, back then but uh, this friendship has grown and is still alive uh, after almost 20 years so I am planning to go to Georgia to visit this friend of mine in Tbilisi in maybe two or three or maybe four years, I don't know, when my kids are a bit um, grown up as well. And uh, I want absolutely to be able to speak to, to her family as well and her friends. And I don't know Russian and I'm not plan planning on learning any Russian uh, anytime soon. So. It's Georgian, and <laughs> I actually love this language. Uh, as I said before, I can only learn what I like, and um, I discovered I like this language a lot. And now it's working, uh, and I'm and I'm learning it, even though very slowly. And the main challenges there, I understand, are all the extra consonants, which uh, are not found necessarily in mm -hmm. any other language that you know. Is that right? So the the extra sounds. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, the sounds the sounds were difficult at the beginning, but once you got them down, like in Chinese, uh, you discover that the the harder part is actually the verb system. The, the verb, verb system, system is system. what I was going to say. Yeah, it's absolutely yeah. crazy. Yeah. Absolutely. So, like Basque, it's, it's ergative, isn't it? It has ergativity. Yeah, 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 excuse yeah, but, me. Yeah. Uh, I don't know about Basque. You you have to tell me, but uh, Georgian has a split erg ergative split ergative it means the ergative actually works only <laughs> um, for certain conjugations and for certain tenses that is 
the same verb like uh, to buy, I think it's first conjugation, if I'm not wrong. Uh, if I say I buy, uh, I will buy a car uh, today or tomorrow, it's not, you don't use the ergative. But if, I say, if you said I bought a car yesterday, you have to use the ergative because the tense changes. It's <laughs> just so, crazy. For those of you, I'm sure there'll be very few, very intelligent audience here, very keyed yeah, up yeah. audience. But if anyone doesn't know what ergativity is, uh, I'll try to explain it. And then uh, Stephanie will maybe explain it a bit better. But it's when the subject, uh, the subject sort of, you have case endings or changes on the subject rather than the object. So, you know, um, uh, um, in German, you might have the object of the sentence changing, the thing you do something to, but you as the mm. doer change uh, um, in, in Basque or sometimes in Georgian. Yeah. Yes, yeah. that's correct. Yes. Yeah. That's so so correct. that's that's what it is. And there are very few languages that do this, but... Um, and it, obviously, and we both picked to one of them. We so. did, yes. But we I've not heard of split ergativity before. So that delight awaits me when I eventually, as I do want to do, uh, get to Georgian at some point. What about resources, though? A bit difficult there. There's the Hippocrene. Yeah, you may have. I, I, I do think you have more resources than I than I do at the moment. Yes, yes. I have this one. I, I have it here. I wanted to, to show it to you. This yes, is my textbook. I finished, yes. yeah. I finished reading through this uh, twice. Um, like last week, um, I think I am. I am around six months into my Georgian project, and uh, now now I'm at a pretty difficult point because um, I don't actually know what to go, uh, what to do next, or where to go next. So I have to do some research and um, decide where to move, how to move. Well, maybe I could show you what I've got at my shelf. If you can have just a, 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 a brief intermission. <laughs> so I'll, I will uh, cut my legs out when I do the editing, folks. Um... <laughs> but yes, what I have, basically, my whole roster of books is here. Anybody's interested in learning Georgian, uh, then probably, yes, the, this is the one that you have the most accessible. And there's one of these for Basque, actually. It's a, Hippocrene is a great publisher. They do a lot of uh, lesser used, well, not lesser used, but uh, less mainstream from an Anglo-Saxon or, or Italian, for that matter, perspective languages. And the great thing is it has the audio CD as well. And for me, it's, uh, you know, it's a deal breaker if I don't have good audio. Oh, of yeah. Course. Same um, for me, same for me. Other beginners, I have this very, uh, this is one that I've had for about 15 years. It's Nikolai Shvili, Georgian language. This is a beginner's mm -hmm. book. This came with cassette tapes, if anybody remembers those, which I have <laughs> on my shelf too. Uh, so I think when I eventually start, I'd use those too. But there's this one in French as well, Parlons Georgien. Oh, Parlons Georgien. Yes. Wow. Uh, this is okay. also a, begin yeah, but, uh, it's a beginner's couple. one. But um, mm -hmm. that might be interesting for not for you, I would guess, at this stage, but for beginners. And then I suppose the biggies are Aronson, Georgian language, uh, Georgian reading grammar. <laughs> this is from the Slavica <laughs> Press. And um, th it is actually a book which is done as if by a typewriter sort of type yeah okay uh, I see. and but that would be i think a great place for you to go as somebody who likes hmm. grammar and has already done the basics and then he, he also has with actually uh the same woman or is it a man i don't know dodonna kisria uh who wrote this one she with aronson put together this georgian language and culture a continuing course wow which is uh, also the Slavic Press, and that is very, very hardcore. It's very serious. What? It has more grammar, extracts, vocabulary, but it is <laughs> 500 and 638 or something pages long. <laughs> Intriguing. So, so Intriguing. that might be, again, uh, mortals, mortals among us, mortals, you know, we will stick with this. 
but uh, you've done that already, so you maybe need to move to these. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, but anyway, let me know where it goes. Where it goes. Um, anyway, we ought to wind this up. <laughs> um, but I mean, I could go on for ages with these discussions, <laughs> Stefano. And um, I hope that people at home have enjoyed this discussion as much as I have. It's been great. great to finally to pin you down and to hear about the way languages came into your life and stay there and the different languages you've chosen and also the career perspectives and the method perspectives that you are able to share. So, Stefano, thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank I you for hope me. to see you again soon. Uh, are you going to yep. Fukuoka to the Polyglot Conference in Japan? No, I can't make it to you Fukuoka, can't. but I will definitely uh, go to Poland next next year for the Polyglot Conference. So I will hope to see you at the gathering next year in Poland then. Thank you very much. Yep. Everybody, I hope you've enjoyed the conversation, as I say. Thanks very, very much for watching. As always, don't forget to subscribe for the vibe, throw me a thumbs up, tickle that bell, and share or be square. See you next time. Thanks a lot, Stefano. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.